Hey guys, it's Rogaway here and we're doing another video tutorial and today we are looking at macro photos. This is kind of an introductory uh, lesson to macro photos. I'll have another one later on that's a little more advanced, but uh, let's get started. In the tutorial folder I got two files here. I got a raw file and I got a folder called stack, stack one. Um, and we're going to look at uh, what uh, this looks like and, and how we can apply this to our macro photography. So let's start with the raw file and let's get that open. Now, we, while this is loading up, I just want to talk a little bit about this. Um, macro photos obviously are taking photos of small things, zooming in closely and uh, getting uh, basically as close as we can to small objects. And one thing you notice when you do get closer and closer and closer to a subject, your band of focus, your depth of field becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in my next photo rather than this one. What I wanted to talk about in this one is um, the speed at which your photos have to be taken when you're doing macro photos. Um, not always, if it's a still life type scene, then you don't have to have a fast shutter speed. But you'll notice here I was shooting at 1 250th ISO 200 um, at 50 millimeters. And you can see by the reflection in the eye, I'm using a uh, flash, a speed light in this case. And the point I'm trying to make, or what I'm trying to show here, is be very mindful of the photo that you take, especially when you're doing macros, or any photo for that case, or for that matter. Um, it's okay to take a photo that's slightly underexposed rather than one that's overexposed. And I'm going to show you why. If we look at this photo, it is underexposed. It's dark. This is a photo of my daughter's eye. And you'll notice that it is pretty dark. Um, but even though it looks black in the eye here, for example, there is still information there. And I'm going to show you how we can bring that back. The reasoning I'm clumping this in with uh, macro photography is because as we get close to our subjects again, we need more light. If you're using a ring light, um, that's a little different. You have the light right at your subject. But if you don't have access to one, uh, you need lots of light. You need to uh, take a shot that's, uh, that's bright uh, in order to get all the details. So let's start right off the hop here by increasing our exposure. All right, and you can see now that we're starting to see the color in the eye itself. And just bump the contrast a tiny bit. Let's go with the highlights. All right, so we're bringing out the whites of the eyes here. And watch what happens once I go with my shadows, which is targeting the dark areas of the shot. Look how much detail we're able to draw out of that dark area. All right, before it looked underexposed, it looked like it was completely black, but now we can see the details in the eye itself. We can also see the reflection of me a little better there. You can see that I was holding my iPad up and I was doing some tests there that didn't quite work out. Um, but you can see that with a dark photo, we're able to recover some of that lost detail in post-processing. Now you gotta be careful because if you go too much, if you go from a really dark image and you try to brighten it up, um, it's going to have a lot of noise in those dark areas. So you got to watch out for that. You got to make sure that um, it's just slightly underexposed, not, not really, really dark. But as you can see, the detail is there, and we're going to hit open image. Actually, before I do that, I'm just going to make sure there's no uh, distortion. Everything looks good. I always like to add a little bit of a vignette. That's just me personally. Don't have to. And I'm going to hit open image. And let's let that load. Okay, so there's our image. Like I said, you can see that I've brought back some of that detail in the eye. And um, we're also going to talk about a couple of other tools here that we can use, not just for macros, but for all of our photos. And uh, we've discussed these tools before. But we're going to review. We got Dodge and Burn. And Dodge and Burn are traditional tools that um, actually were chemicals originally used uh, when people did film stripping back a long time ago before the digital revolution. Um, and some people still do it. 
Dodge will lighten your image and burn will darken your image. So in this case, if I wanted to add a kind of a neat effect to the, to the eye itself, to the iris here, I could use the Dodge tool and just check up top here. That exposure is 50%. I got protect tones on and I'm using the mid tones here. I'm going to go with a bigger brush and make sure it's set really soft. And I'm just going to paint around the eye. Now you don't see much of a change. In fact, you have to go over it a few times to, uh, sorry, before you start to make any difference. And you can see it starting to lighten up. And I'm starting to get even more detail pulled out in the eye. I'm kind of getting a cool effect as well where the light looks like it's radiating from the inside. That's the point of the Dodge tool is it lightens it up and if Protect Tones is on there, it tries really hard to make sure that you don't lose any quality in those tones as you lighten it up. Now Burn has the opposite effect, same settings though, and it will take away light or darken the area that you're painting over. So if I go around the outside of the eye here, for example, just to show you, you'll notice that it's darkening the outside of the eye. Now that kind of looks weird. I'm just going to undo that. But you can see that I can do this anywhere. I can, I can add, I can darken up the skin up here. You know, if I want to add more emphasis to the eye itself, I can just keep darkening that if I want. And I get kind of that effect where it looks like a light was placed directly on the eye. And if I go to my history and I just look at the before and after, you'll see that it's quite a noticeable difference. It's quite a noticeable change. So dodge and burn can give you some really cool effects. And I like the fact that they kind of let you control where the light in the photo is and also where the shadows are too. One other tool that I find kind of useful for macro photography is called the sharpen tool. There's also the blur tool, but we want to get our photo as sharp as possible. So we're going to go to the sharpen tool. Same exact settings again, except uh, just different names here. Strength 50%, protect detail instead of protect tones. All right, and what I can do with the sharpen tool is I can bring out areas where I want to bring out more detail or sharpen it up. So you can see same deal here when I go over it makes very little difference. All right, hardly noticeable. If I keep going over the area well then I start to see little artifacts and you'll see the before and after where it's very hard to notice but it does sharpen it up. So I can go over this part here with the eyelashes and bring out some detail in there that might not have been there. And you see that it takes a couple seconds for it to load because it is doing quite a bit of work here, sharpening up each pixel. And the more passes that I give it over whatever I'm trying to sharpen, well, the sharper it's going to become. Up to a certain point, like I said, and then it starts to go kind of uh, weird. It starts to bring out weird colors. Okay, so we're done with that. Like I said, that shows you like I said, if you have an underexposed picture, uh, how you can bring back some of that detail, how you can dodge and burn to uh, create interesting effects as well. Save it. All right, I'm going to save this to my desktop. I'm just going to call it, I'll just call it I. Doesn't really matter. And save. Oh, there's already an I there on the desktop. So I guess I'll call it macro and save it. Now the next thing I want to talk about is a common problem with macro photos. And let's just look at this example. Um, I don't take any credit for these photos. Uh, this is strictly for um, educational purposes only. But let's just take a quick look at the three photos I've got to show you. The first one, these are all of these two um, dragonfly subjects. The first one is a shot of the actual husk that the dragonfly hatched out of and the dragonfly and you'll notice that the focus is on the husk itself. The dragonfly in the background is blurred out and this is very common with macro photos where you only have that very narrow band of focus and you can't get everything in focus. Let's go to the next example here. I'm going to go to number two. Number two shows us that the photographer has used his focusing ring to now focus on the back, at least part of the back dragonfly. He's got the leg of the husk in, in focus there too. And now this has become blurry. 
All right, at least most of it. At the back, it's still a little bit in focus. And this is what I'm talking about. You have that very narrow band of focus. All right, the third shot, whoops, third shot, oh, hang on, sorry. The third photo, now this dragonfly in the back is completely in focus and the front subject is blurry. Now, this is called, well, the process that we're looking at here is called focus stacking. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to take these three separate exposures and create one macro photo that has everything in focus. All right, like I said, traditionally, you just lived with your macro shot the way that it was. All right, wherever that focus fell, well, that's how it was. This would be your shot. But now with focus stacking, we're able to extend the depth of field more. And uh, you'll hear photographers that shoot bugs and insects and small things all the time that they stack their images. Sometimes they'll say, oh, um, I stacked this 14 with 14 different images. What we're looking at here is a three image stack. We're going to open up all three with Photoshop. This is very easy to do. Um, I recommend using a tripod. What you're doing is you're taking a photo, focusing a little further, all right, until you get the entire range that you want in, um, in a series of shots, basically, uh, in focus. So I'm just going to put them in order. Like I said, we can look through these again. I'm going to just close the macro, the first one that I did here. So if I go in order, there's that front subject in focus. Second one, back and a little bit of the front in focus. Third, the back uh, subject entirely in focus. And like I said, the way that we do this is we take our SLR camera, we switch our lens to manual uh, focus, which is on the lens itself. Um, we can use a tripod so it doesn't move around that much. And we just take a series of shots, just adjusting that manual focus, the focusing dial on our lens just a little bit at a time to get this range of focus. Now what do we do with these images? We're going to go to image number two. I'm going to press command A so that it becomes selected. I'm going to go to edit copy or command C on the Mac here and I'm going to paste it on top of number one. So we got number two, we got number one on top of each other. Then we're going to go to number three, we're going to go command A, we're going to go to edit copy, we're going to go back to number one and we're going to paste it, command V or edit paste. And I'm going to close these other two tabs because now we have all of these images inside this one file. All right. Now you will notice that this person probably was not using a tripod. Maybe they were, but uh, it does move quite a bit. What we're going to do is we're going to hold the shift key and we're going to select all of our layers. Okay. The way I did that is you just click the top one, hold shift and click the bottom one so that they all become highlighted. Then we're going to go to edit. We're going to go to auto align layers. Now this is a handy little feature that Photoshop has. Auto align features, uh, auto align layers will look at different features of each layer and line them up so that they're perfectly in position. So we're going to set it to auto and we're going to hit OK. It goes really fast and now when we turn off each layer, you can see that Photoshop has done a good job of lining them up because it has lots of reference material here and it knows where they belong. Now using that same method, we're going to hold shift, we're going to select all of our layers and we're going to go to Edit Auto Blend Layers. Now Photoshop is awesome in the way that it uh, caters to photographers. It has a Stack Images option here. And what that's going to do is it's going to stack those multiple exposures uh, that were focused differently into one image, as you can see by the example. So I'm going to hit OK. Takes a couple seconds, doesn't take too long. And what it's doing it's actually pretty amazing. It's comparing each image on each layer and finding the sharpest parts, the parts that are in focus the best, and merging them together. Now look at that. There's our example. Whoop, hard to see, sorry. Um, there it is. All right, if we look at each layer, there's the first one, there's the second one, there's the third one. Photoshop has done a great job of finding the sharpest parts of each image and combining them into one macro photo. Or I can then go and crop off the edges if, if I find that it didn't do uh, 
it didn't overlap perfectly. That usually is the case. I can take a little bit off the edge. No big deal. But you can see what I've done is I have effectively increased my depth of field. Now, if I'm working on a very small subject and I'm using a big macro lens or I'm using extender tubes or whatever and I'm really zoomed in or even a, a reversed lens, um, what I would do is I would take a series of focus shots, as you see here, and then put them all together to get one really nice focused image. All right, so let's save that. I'm going to call it stack. I'm just going to save it to the desktop, hit OK. All right, and hopefully you learned something there. And I do recommend you use that with your macro photography uh, to increase the effectiveness of your macro shots. Um, and like I said, don't be afraid to underexpose once in a while. You'll be able to bring back a lot of that detail. All right, so hopefully you learned something there and hopefully you use it. Talk to you later.